I'm Henry Jenkins. I'm the co-director of the Comparative Media Studies program at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Uh, we're a program that tries to train the next generation of leaders for industry, for journalism, for policy, for arts, for education, to think across media platforms and to try to understand the nature of the media change that's taking, taking place. One of the areas where we're doing a lot of work right now is the area of new media literacies. Uh, where we're trying to understand the social skills and cultural competencies that are emerging as young people move into a world of participatory culture. Now, can you define participatory culture for us? For me, participatory culture is, would, is a term that's used to describe spaces where we are very open for individual contributions, where there's a supportive environment where people can learn and grow and share what they produce. So everything from video blogging and YouTube to the gaming world to the world of fan fiction would qualify as participatory cultures. We think these are sites where young people and adults learn together, create together, grow together, communicate together, outside of some of the rigid formal structures that shape school in its current form. Now one of the things I've read about in the participatory cultures um, readings is that it's fairly um, open and people feel that their contributions are going to be valued. And I've done some work showing that there's a bit of a complication to that sometimes. For example, on YouTube, sometimes people feel that, you know, there's a bit of a struggle. There are haters, <clears throat> bad reactions. And I kind of wondered, how does that fit into the idea of participatory culture? Well, I think, I think there are, there, we don't want to overly idealize participatory cultures. That <clears throat> they certainly do create mechanisms that encourage participation. But they're not closed communities in the world of the web. So as I look at something like YouTube, what I see is a, is a hybrid media ecology where many participatory cultures come together. And it's precisely because there's tensions between participatory cultures and because it's open to a public much larger than the participatory cultures that you start to see hating and conflict and, and sort of backlash against individual contributions. And I think that's one of the challenges to think about. And it, participatory culture, in some senses, predates most of the digital platforms we currently have to talk about. The fan cultures that I study most extensively can trace their roots back to the teens or 20s. Uh, they have a long history. Within their own space, they've been deeply supportive, although not without conflicts or feuds or, you know, phantasms, as fans, fans call it, or big name fans and little name fans, and all of that stuff goes on there. But I think fans in general are subjected to harsher comments when they enter into YouTube or when they enter MySpace or some of the larger public forums. So I think it's not contradictory to say that participatory cultures on their own are supportive, but that they're entering into a larger space where we have to learn how to deal with relations between participatory cultures. Do you think that participatory cultures have kind of a <clears throat> life cycle where they maybe start um, a bit more open, uh, less bureaucratized, and then over time as they have to deal with larger populations, they, they have more bureaucracy? I don't know if bureaucracy is the right word. I think they remain what I call ad hocracies. It's a term I borrow from uh, Cory Doctorow, who uses the term. But I think that they, they emerge with certain hierarchies and that they develop mechanisms to protect themselves. So what I've seen with fan cultures is they venture out periodically, try to go more public, become more inclusive. Problems emerge from that, and they retreat into more private spaces. So the tension between, say, LiveJournal as a site, which is fairly localized, fairly small, intimate community, and YouTube, where many of the fan groups that I look at feel extremely exposed. They're not ready to go out into the public space of YouTube. There's the, con the backlash there is much, much too intense. And so they move between the, the sort of highly public to highly private modes of engagement. And it seems to be generational. They periodically will duck their heads out, see what's going on try to take a sense of how safe it is to be out in the public. For fan cultures, that's also shaped, of course, by legality. That is, fan cultures frequently appropriate, remix, transform content from media producers. And as a response, and, and as a result, they have to be very careful about what the prevailing legal climate is. The idea is, how do we transform the relations of universities to the public in an era of YouTube and blogging? And it can be as simple as academic bloggers, pod podcast, video blogging, other ways of getting our events outside of our own communities. It can be more elaborate, such as using virtual worlds to create shared spaces 
where students come together and faculty come together from institutions around the planet. It can be building a social network around an academic program so that their expertise is not rooted within a single university, but in fact people draw on experts, friends of the program, people in the private sector come in and become part of the social system around them. So I say about comparative media studies, we don't have a faculty. We really have a relatively small faculty, but we do have a network. And that sense of a network means that we have people we can draw on, we can connect students with. So that my master's students may have on their thesis committee a Bollywood choreographer, a video gamer, a, a journalist, a policy maker uh, from all over the world. And because we now have access to these new media channels, if we create equally open structures, we can bring those people together and they can meaningfully interact with each other. So right now what keeps universities from achieving that is their own bureaucracy. They haven't thought loosely enough, they haven't thought in ad hoc ways about what it is to create structures of knowledge that are just in time, that are responsive to the individual students and their research interest and the emergence of new fields, but are instead governed by where the university was 20 years ago, 100 years ago protecting our borders, holding knowledge in, rather than allowing it to circulate freely. Mm -hmm. So just as in the world of me new media, we can say that media has moved from an era of stickiness to spreadability, that if media doesn't spread, it's dead, we might want to think about what makes knowledge spreadable, or what en enables us to connect our students in exciting ways to people all over the world, rather than feeling like we've got to lock them down in a classroom and hold on to disciplinary borders in order to protect our turf, which is the way too many universities operate. We've talked a little bit about the universities. What about younger kids? Do you have any uh, one or two policy prescriptions that you think might be helpful in changing education at a younger level? Well, I think, I think a lot of the work we're doing with new media literacies is trying to reimagine what schools could look like if they took advantage of the, the affordances of the new media platform. So. You know, one example of the kind of work is we're really trying to think about remix culture in a new way. That by not talking openly about the way culture builds on itself, we give kids a false sense of the creative process. That we, we reinforce a very narrow notion of intellectual property by continually imagining these great men who created works in total isolation from each other and drew nothing in the culture around them. So instead, we're developing a teacher's guide that will help teachers learn how to think about re past remixing pro practices and imagine how their kids could be involved in rewriting and re reappropriating classic works of literature. So the project, we're, our case study for that is Herman Melville, who we're going to argue was, a you know, having written the great American novel, it's actually a mashup. That if we think of Moby Dick as, in fact, a, a masterful remixing of the Bible, of Homer, of Shakespeare, of ideas from his contemporaries from Emerson and Hawthorne, ideas from whaling lore, that Mo Melville continually churned up and reworked all of the things around him to create this work that is where all the things that are strange about to us about Moby Dick, the constant digressions, the long encyclopedic entries, the shifts in voice, make sense if we understand it as a piece of remixed culture. So we're using that to sort of explore what can we do to get kids not just to read the classics, but to remix them, to mash them up, to appropriate them, to make their own. Because the idea that these works of the past were somehow pristine and self-contained doesn't do justice to the rich dialogue that exists between those works and the culture around it. So we can see Shakespeare is doing fan fiction where he takes the characters from other people's play and right. flesh them out. We can see the Sistine Chapel as a mashup of imagery from the Bible. The, the, the history of the Western canon has to be understood as appropriation of transformation of ideas. And we think those are ideas you can bring down to young people in schools at a fairly young age, getting them to retell classic fairy tales, uh, you know, telling the story of Little Red Riding Hood from the Big Bad Wolf's point of view.